Now, a lot of people may not know this, but I am actually a massive Garfield fan. So I couldn't think of a better retrospective than to do one on Garfield caught in the act. I have so many fond memories of Garfield taking out the comic strip compilations from my local library and just absolutely loving the orange cat. So guys, let's take a look at this underrated classic. When you think of video games, and more specifically licensed video games, Garfield may not be the first thing that comes to mind, but the famous Orange Cat has actually had quite a few video games over the years, but the US wouldn't actually get one on consoles until 1995, when the Sega Genesis and Game Gear would get Garfield caught in the act. With the Genesis game being developed by Sega Interactive, a rare instance when Sega themselves developed a licensed game. Both games are similar and share the same story and gameplay, but they're designed quite different level-wise. So I got done playing the Genesis game and figured, hey, why not play the Game Gear version for a more complete retrospective on this game? Now there is a PC version, but it can be quite a pain to run, and besides Red Book Audio Music and an additional level, it's basically the same as the Genesis version. But somehow, there doesn't exist a convenient way of emulating this one without the actual CD or using a virtual machine. That's truly an elusive version of this game, but we'll be talking about those extras in a moment. It's interesting to note that Caught in the Act is actually an unfinished game that was planned to have three more levels than what we got in the finished product, making for a rather short experience. These levels are actually playable on the Genesis through the innovative Sega channel from back in the day, where Sega would transit a signal to Genesis owners' consoles that would enable them to play exclusive games through a subscription service. The game was called Garfield Caught in the Act, The Lost Levels. And no, not a single bit of footage is available of these levels. Except for one, and that's if you play the PC version. You can play the stage Alien Landscape, which is a rather short stage compared to the others. Other than that, The Lost Levels is lost to time and no ROM has ever been recovered of it. It has unfortunately fallen to the category of lost media. So whichever version of the game you're playing, the opening cutscene sees Garfield watching TV and Odie comes along and scares the ever-loving cat turds out of Garfield's orange ass, causing him to break the TV. Garfield reassembles the TV in a haphazard fashion and this causes a creature known as the Glitch to be created from the spare parts that Garfield carelessly chucks to the side and he transports him into the TV. The Game Gear version actually has a longer cutscene, believe it or not. The story is similar to the Garfield and Friends episode, The Lasagna Zone, and the levels have a few callbacks to the graphic novel and the TV special, Garfield, His Nine Lives. So let's touch on the Genesis version of the game first. Garfield will start off in the cybernetic hub world, which is inside the TV, and you'll see all the circuits and parts, and it looks way neater than how Garfield repaired it. I guess the glitch was nice enough to at least repair the TV in exchange for putting us through this ordeal. I love the look and feel of it. It has a really ominous, creepy vibe, especially with that foreboding music. You return here after each stage and have to do some basic platforming to find a door that takes you to the next level. Now there's two difficulty options to choose from Kitty and Normal, and the only difference is that Kitty features arrows that point you in the correct direction. I'd recommend leaving it on Normal because it's not like the game is too crazy when it comes to finding out where to go. You'll then enter the first level, Count Slobulous Castle. Well, actually the graveyard outside of it and it's very reminiscent of ghosts and goblins. And you'll see some tremendous graphics. Oh my lord, does this game look good. These hand-drawn graphics look just as good as the masterly drawn comics by Jim Davis. Uh, hey, wait. These sprites were drawn by Jim Davis. Yup, 
That's right, the actual creator, illustrator, and writer for the Garfield comic strips actually worked on this game and contributed to the art. That's amazing. That's truly something else. I love how Jim Davis cared about his art and creation so much, he actually wanted this game to look as good as it possibly could. And as a result, the animations and art look fucking fantastic. This is one of my favorite looking 16-bit games, to be honest. It's really that good. Garfield's sprite meshes so well with the background, and it's easy to see why Sega actually requested that this stage be the first level in the game. Garfield is decked out in a little cloak and vest, and he'll be wearing an outfit that corresponds with the theme of each stage, which is very cute, and I like that sense of extra detail. You'll also notice it's really easy to die here. Enemies are abundant, and some of these jumps don't go easy on you. Getting over these gates is a bitch to say the least. I feel like I can never jump just right to make it over one without losing health. Then you'll fall into these greys if you're not careful, and these ghosts come right at you. You're dying the first time you play this level, I guarantee it. At least Garfield has 10 hit points, so he can take quite a bit of punishment. You're armed with a short-range melee weapon, a torch, and a throwing weapon, a skull, and each level, with the exception of the final level, has its own melee weapon and throwing weapons. You'll soon find a remote control that takes you to Count Slobula, who is actually Odie, dressed as a vampire. And you must whack him with your torch to send him retreating into his coffin, and then you'll jump up to the window shade to pull it up, damaging him. All these bats can be a real pain in the ass, and it makes it real hard to not take at least a few hits here. It's actually really disappointing that the level is called... Count Slobula's castle, but this boss is all you see of the castle. But actually, in the Game Gear version, which we'll be getting to in a bit, features a full fleshed out castle portion in its interpretation of the level. With such a dazzling looking game, I would have loved to see the 16-bit interpretation. You'll then play a whack-a-mole style bonus round if you collected the mallet, and these I can never play correctly, and quite frankly, it's not a big concern to me. The glitch will then reappear and transport Garfield, and it's funny because in the cutscene and during the Whack-A-Mole minigame, he looks like a cybernetic insect, but his actual in-game model looks like a robotic fox. It's just surreal to see this type of character aesthetic in any type of Garfield media. And you'll play the commercial break bonus stage, which you'll get after every level, where Garfield rockets through a vortex, collecting pookies and avoiding hazards, and if you collect enough, you'll earn extra lives and continues. Revenge of Orange Bear is next, and Garfield dons a pirate hat and has a wooden sword and bombs. And he'll start off on a tiny boat as he sails across the sea combating bats, skeletal pirates, and octopus arms, and you'll make your way into a cave, and I swear it is impossible to not get hit by these vines. The sword attack and bombs don't work, and it can be pretty frustrating in the second half, as you'll have to navigate these tree branches and climb across these ropes, and these fucking birds are just waiting to attack, and they're literally waiting. They won't touch you when you're hanging and climbing, so that's short courteous of them. What's sporting enemies? The problem is, you can't drop down from the ropes, and if you fall down from all the chaos going on up here, you'll face a really frustrating setback. The boss here is another skeleton pirate, Orangebeard, who looks almost identical to the ones you've been encountering throughout the entire level, which just screams lazy. He's just a reskin. Why not an actual pirate? Cave Cat 3 million BC is the next level, and Garfield will have a pair of saber tooth tiger teeth, just like in Garfield, his nine lives. This stage, again, is very platform heavy, especially in this part where you must climb up this cheese waterfall by jumping from falling pieces of broccoli that you're sure to mistake for rocks at first. It's actually funny that Sega requested that this level not be the first stage in the game, and you can kind of see why. I feel like they could have done more with this aesthetic. Not a bad level by any means. It's actually quite enjoyable and well made. 
and probably the least frustrating, but it does feel a bit more drab compared to the others. Dino Odie is the boss, and dear lord, they fucked up here. Now, the design of the boss battle is fine, as you'll use the falling boulders to launch them up at Odie, and then attack him when he falls down to the ground. Simple enough, right? Well, did you know that if you go a little too far to one side of the screen, Odie can actually go out of frame and never return, leaving you soft-locked. And guess what? There's no time limit to run out and no way to kill yourself. So if this happens, you're basically fucked. And I've tested it. It always happens. How the hell did the game developers miss this? And if you think that's a rage-inducing oversight, wait until we get to the Game Gear version. And I'm not referring to this boss battle, because this actually doesn't happen in that version. Casablanca follows, and this is my favorite stage. Wow, this is a good-looking stage, as everything is in black and white except for Garfield wearing a fedora. It's an old to film noir, and come on, the name is a play on Casablanca after all. And this level looks utterly fantastic. For some reason, these identical angry old men are furious with Garfield and they're throwing shit at him. Garfield has a rolled up newspaper and his throwing weapon is tin cans. Wow, I think they should have been more creative than that. Why not have him throw the hat like odd job or something. This is a labyrinth of a level as you'll have to make your way into the sewers and enter doors to come out of other doors and find your way to the boss. This is some Scooby doing for sure because how is he entering one door and coming out of another that is not even connected unless it's supposed to be the back door to the same building even if it looks like the front plus how does a sewer tunnel lead to an apartment building door? And my brain just turned into mushy lasagna. The boss here is a dog in a trench coat, and he'll be hurling bombs at you, which can be pretty hard to avoid. So you'll need to work quickly and throw the ones that don't explode into the drain pipes, and they'll come out at the bottom and damage the dog. It turns out that there was originally a train segment plan for this stage, but it was cut just like the removed levels, and you can actually see the train on the back of the game case. That looks like it would have been fun and would have added even more to the overall beautiful aesthetic of the level. The PC version of this stage has a big upgrade in music, really adding to the mood and vibe of the stage. Here, have a listen between the two versions and see for yourself. The Curse of Cleophatra is the final full level of the game and is another great looking level with a really cool aesthetic. I haven't seen an Egyptian themed level this cool since Sandopolis Zone Act 2 and Sonic 3 and Knuckles. I like all the death traps that are just waiting to be sprung by Garfield stepping on floor switches. This pendulum platform can be pretty tricky to use to open this door when you first encounter it if you don't know what to do. And speaking of Sonic, I really like the momentum-based physics here. You know, there's something very charming about seeing John look like the Sphinx. Then it's time to face off against the glitch in a really well-designed boss fight as you push these mirrors into place and his shots will ricochet back at him. And it's quite satisfying. I love how with each hit his attacks get faster and faster as the damage is making the glitch glitch out. That maniacal clown-like laughter and growls add a lot of charm to the otherwise mysterious entity. <laughs> Plus, Jesus Christ, this music rocks. Whether it's the Genesis or PC version, bold styles of instrumentation make for a classic underrated track.
So that just about does it for the Genesis version of the game. So what about the Game Gear version? Well, it's quite different, with completely different level design, with some instances of similarity, plus two new levels to boot, and a totally different OST. Graphically, the game looks great for an 8-bit game, and it certainly lives up to the art direction of the 16-bit version as well as it can. It's not exactly crisp, but it tries to be as detailed as possible, which usually results in a lack of crispness. The Garfield sprite looks good, but it's not exactly as good looking as, say, Sonic sprite in one of the 8-bit Sonic games. It looks a little blurrier, but that's probably due to the level of detail they gave his sprite. Garfield has no melee weapons and doesn't wear costumes for each stage, but he still has a throwing weapon for each. When he runs out, he can use a paw swipe, which is nice. He also has a running command, which wasn't present in the 16-bit version, and you'll be using it quite a bit. The whole world is present, and it's been more fleshed out, which I like. And touching any of these balls will result in you being sent back to the starting point and you'll need to perform platforming challenges. The first stage here is Cave Cat 3 million BC, which is interesting because this is what the developers actually planned to have as the first level of the Genesis version. This level, though not a bad one, goes on way too long. I mean, holy shit. This thing just keeps going and going, and I do appreciate the incorporation of more interesting elements than the 16-bit version, like John as a caveman. And listen to this. Doesn't it sound like he's saying Garfield in 8-bit sound? Yeah, he is, isn't he? That's pretty cute, actually. Plus, I obviously love how the boss isn't glitched to fuck in this version, which is much appreciated. It's nice to not get softlocked. It's just such a long, dragged out fucking level. I was actually laughing to myself playing it, saying, damn, this is still going? Now, if you collect an Arlene icon, you'll gain access to the bonus stage, which is way better than the commercial break or whack-a-mole bonus stages from the 16-bit version. You'll run around Garfield's living room and destroy portraits, lamps, and other objects, and you'll score an extra life if you destroy enough stuff. Just one question, how is Garfield accessing his living room if he's trapped in the TV? Uh, maybe he was transported into an episode of Garfield and Friends? The Curse of Cleopatra is next, and damn, this is one that has some tight platforming. I don't like it as much as the 16-bit iteration, and there isn't any death traps. It's interesting that this version incorporated Ghost, which brings me back to my comparison to Sandopolis. The boss fight is actually against Cleopatra's ghost, which makes sense since the stage is called the Curse of Cleopatra, not the Curse of John the Sphinx. Curiously, she's not fat, so there's a little false advertising here. This fight is really a joke. All you have to do is throw a bunch of onks at her and that's it. Bonehead the Barbarian is next, and this is actually the name of one of the cut stages that was originally planned to be in the 16-bit version. Whether or not the level design was planned to be similar, or if the whole level was ported over is a mystery. But this level was not thought through, as one of the biggest aspects of it is pushing these Odie statues. And if you do it incorrectly, you can actually soft lock yourself, and actually this can happen in more than one location. Now luckily, later on in the level, you can actually reset them by going far enough away from them. But holy shit! What an oversight! And this is what I was talking about before when I mentioned the Dino Odie boss fight in the Genesis version. Where were the developers to test this? I honestly cannot believe this soft lock is so easy to do. It's not even like some weird technique that can get you soft locked. I'm genuinely playing the game as intended. And it fucking fucks me over. But once you get to the section of the second half of the stage where soft locks are impossible as far as I can tell, some of these puzzles with the statues are actually pretty fun to figure out. The boss is Bonehead the Barbarian himself, 
And it's peculiar that they missed out on the opportunity to make him Rick Deltoy, which is the character on Garfield and Friends, that Garfield actually called Bonehead the Barbarian as an insult, which obviously inspired the level name. Count Slobulous Castle is the next level, and this is way better done than the 16-bit version, even if it's not as aesthetically pleasing, but you actually get the graveyard and the fully fleshed out castle. Considering the name of this level is Count Slobulous Castle after all, I'd say it's pretty fitting to actually have the entire castle featured in the game. You'll have to go from room to room and collect keys, and it's a pretty enjoyable level. The only problem? Why is John the vampire this time around? It's Count Slobulous Castle, not Count John's. That's weird. Revenge of Orangebeard comes next, and the first half of the stage is completely different in design from the 16-bit version, as you'll need to platform up objects and alligators in the water. But if you fall in the water, you'll be sent spinning all the way back to the last checkpoint, which can be rather frustrating. The second half is pretty similar to what's offered in the 16-bit version as you'll be platforming among the tree branches in a swamp, but these enemies will not wait for you to finish climbing the ropes to attack you. The boss battle involves more strategy as you'll need to wait for Orangebeard to throw his skull at you before you can damage him. Slobbin Hood is the next stage and the name of one of the originally planned stages for the 16-bit game. But man, this one is pretty uninteresting. It's very basic and nothing to write home about. It's a forest level, but I think I saw enough trees in the swamp section of the orange beard stage. Plus, there's nothing too Robin Hoody about this. I mean, there's this fort that shoots arrows and there isn't even a boss. I'm almost convinced these are ported over versions of the removed stages because these noticeably suck way more than the other stages. Casablanca follows and this has a really cool opening section of leaping from car to car and you'll need to utilize your running jump here and avoid the old men throwing crap at you which makes the jumps even more difficult if you don't do away with them first. It looks like this is an offshoot of the planned train segment from the 16-bit version. If you fall here when missing a jump, you'll go spinning back to the last checkpoint just like in the Orangebeard stage. You'll also get the best music in the entire game in this section. It's a heck of a bop. The second half is similar to the 16-bit version, but without the labyrinth-like design, and what the hell? Could the prophecy be true? Well, anyway, I initially got stuck because I came to this rat enemy over here who just runs away. And I'm like, oh well. But then while I was exploring, I found out that if you follow him, he jumps into a hole that disappears after he enters it. I figured out that's where I needed to go, so I raced him to the opening and it was very satisfying to figure this out. Because it's not immediately apparent. I liked exploring the level and figuring out where to go. So this was a pretty cool interpretation of my favorite level in the 16-bit version. The boss is a more generic looking dog than the one in the 16-bit version and way easier and we'll find Odie locked in a kennel. That's pretty odd, I didn't know that the actual Odie was sucked into the TV too. TV Wasteland is the final stage and you'll have to contend with a variety of the enemies from the previous levels as well as mini glitches and there's actually some pretty tough platforming here and the precise jumping is quite demanding actually. I like this idea of leading up to a big battle with the glitch. It feels a little off going directly from the Cleopatra level right into final boss fight in the Genesis version. Like where's the transition? 
the final boss fight just suddenly happens and you'll eventually go on to face the glitch and the fight here is actually a bit more elaborate than the 16-bit fight but it takes place in a much smaller area you'll need to rearrange the orientation of the mirrors in a particular fashion to reflect his shots back at him so that's all she wrote and these games are quite fun it's pretty interesting that it seems that the Game Gear version makes up for certain aspects that the 16-bit version lacks, such as having more levels, a more fleshed out Count Slobula level, a better climax, and longer levels, even if that's not always for the best. However, I still have to go with the Genesis version of the game because it just looks so beautiful, it has far superior music, the fantastic Casablanca level, and it just overall feels more like the intended version to play. If you enjoy the Genesis version, I recommend you play the Game Gear version as well. Overall, both of these games are fun, and the Genesis game is one of the best looking video games you'll ever lay eyes on. Liking Garfield will definitely add to your enjoyment, but they're just fun to play, and anyone can appreciate the art direction of the Genesis game in general. So guys, let me know what you think in the comments down below. Have you ever played Garfield caught in the act on the Genesis, the PC, or the Game Gear? I'd love to know, and let's discuss it below. Please subscribe if you haven't already. Click the bell to get all the notifications when I post all my new videos. Hit the like button if you enjoyed the video, and hit the dislike button if you fucking hated it. And any donations that you could give on Patreon would be greatly appreciated. And I want to thank all my subscribers for your continued support. Thanks again for watching, guys. I'll see you next time.